Hello. Welcome back to Soul Search Sunday with Johnny Tiger. The date is July fifth, twenty twenty, and I hope that everyone have had a very enjoyable weekend, July fourth, and then Canada Day a few days before that. It's definitely a week of celebration in a very uncertain time. Now I know when you talk, to, when we come to talk about uncertain times, especially what's going on in the world right now, a lot of us are thinking, "Oh my God, this is so hard, so much hardship." And in fact, even for me, sometimes, well, quite often,、uh, I. Listen to the news, and my heart just aches for the world.、Uh, listening to all the suffering and stuff like that that's going on, but that also makes me think that quite often, when there's hardship like this, a lot of good come out of it, and quite often the world is all the better for it in the end. You see, I've been of the belief for many years that we live in a soft time. We live in a time where people put a lot of value on positivity, on being positive. Everything has to be positive. You have to be positive to your kids. You have to be positive to your coworkers. You have to. To be positive to your friend,、uh, if you have nothing positive to say, then don't say it.、Uh, if you have something honest and criticizing to say, you must find a positive way to say it. Otherwise, don't say it at all. And I think, in some ways, this is hurting our society.、Uh, this is causing a lot of suicide. We well, think. More and more depression. We're seeing more、uh, suicide at younger age. We're seeing people breaking down, having anxiety issues and nervous breakdown, and so on and so on. Uh, people, uh, young people, killing themselves because they got bullied on the internet of all things. It really makes us think that maybe. This overabundance of positivity is causing us to lose the ability to fight off negative things. We are losing the ability to turn negativity into that driving force that quite often end up making us better in the end. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, "A good piece of iron will not become anything unless you hammer it and forge it into something good, and a good piece of jade will not become anything unless you chisel it, polish it, and cut it into something good." And the same applies to people. A lot of people will not surpass themselves, will not reach their full potential, unless they face challenges and pressures in their whole life. A similar Chinese proverb also says, "More people are killed by luxury and overindulgence and comfortable life." Than hardship and difficulties. I mean, just look at it. If you have a child、uh, who's goes who's gone through hardship early on in his or her life,、uh, family life was hard and、uh, upbringing was hard, and no money at home, and a lot of bad stuff happened to them early on. Quite often, by the time they're thirty years old. There's nothing in this world that's going to keep them down. They're so strong mentally, psychologically, physically, that they 
are ready to take on any challenge in the world. Opposite to that, you take a person and you put him or her in a ivory tower, and they grow up having the best of everything, having all the positive reinforcement they can. And then the first time they grow up, they go to work, and a coworker tells them they look fat or they suck. They go home and commit suicide because they can't take that. They're not used to being criticized or being talked at negatively. So, I think there is some truth to this idea. That too much positive、uh, positivity. There is such a thing as too much positivity will make us lose our ability to grow and to face challenges. In my personal life, I can draw three very succinct、uh, examples that would illustrate. What I'm talking about, that difficulties, criticism, challenges, negative comment, actually will make you better if you decide, if you uh, will uh, be willing to turn them into motivation. My family first immigrated to Canada in 1989. And due to some family difficulties, I won't go into in detail, but、uh, will be shown in the upcoming Johnny Tiger documentary. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, we had to move back to Taiwan temporarily、uh, in 1991. After that, I went to school in Taiwan, and I did not return to Canada until. 1995. When I first returned to Taiwan from Canada in 1991, teachers there, students there, treated me like I was some very special person. This this is a guy who's educated in Canada, and then his family rich enough to immigrate to Canada and. He come back now. He speak English. He's better than all of us. Even the teachers treated me with respect. I was very proud of myself in school because all of all the positivity that were flooding me and all the、uh, positive remarks people was making、uh, about me and so on and so on. I got so confident and comfortable. In my little bubble of security, that within one year, I pretty much lost all the English I've gained when I、uh, came to Canada previously. When I went to high school there in Taiwan,、uh, English was one of the courses we had to take there,、uh, and. Everyone expected that the kids who came back from Canada would excel at English. That this would be a piece of cake. So it was to everybody's surprise that I failed my English exams almost every single time. I was too confident, and I let myself get complacent. Enough that I forgot all the English I learned in Canada. In 1995, my family returned to Canada. Well, in fact, my brothers and sister returned to Canada one year ahead of me. So, of course, when I finally came back to Canada, they having that one year head start on me. Knew more English, knew more vocabulary. Were doing a lot better in school than I was. And I remember that time very clearly because it was painful 
This is the thing about these experiences, they were definitely painful. I came back to Canada. Uh, rather than being welcomed by my sister and brothers, they treated me like the laughing stock of the family. Every time they had friends over, and of course, because they came back to Canada one year ahead of me, they had friends. I didn't. I just came back here. I didn't have any friends. So they had friends. They would invite their friends over, and they would, in front of their friends, quiz me on vocabulary and English questions that they clearly knew I didn't know. I would be made a fool of in front of their friends. They would converse with each other in English, and I would have no idea what they were talking about. So, one day, about three months after I returned to Canada, I decided enough was enough. I was not going to be made fun of anymore. I was not going to be the underdog. My entire life. So every day after I came home from school, when my brothers and sister would be downstairs playing PlayStation, when they would have their friends coming over, and、uh, they would be playing cards or、uh, playing basketball or playing soccer or whatever, I shut myself in my room and I forced myself to memorize five. English vocabulary every day. Every day I came home from school, I locked myself in my room, and went through the dictionary, and remember and memorize and learned different words and how they were used and their synonyms and、uh, the sentence structures and so on and so on. Within half a year, I. Was holding the highest grade in school among my siblings. I knew way more English vocabulary than they knew. So, merely half a year ago, they were asking me what's a hippopotamus, and I would have no idea. Half a year later, I would be asking them. What does constitutional mean? And they would have no idea. But this wasn't the end, because even though I was now effectively like a walking dictionary, I still had a lot of time, hard time conversing with people because I I knew the word, but I didn't know the slangs. I didn't know the everyday stuff. Uh, like when people ask me, "Do you want oatmeal or cereal for breakfast?" I had no idea what the difference. I had no idea what kind of cereal they were. Like to me, cereal was cereal. Like I had no idea what kind of brands and stuff like that. What were the choices? When people ask me what kind of muffin I want for breakfast, I had no idea. Like blueberry muffin, bran muffin, chocolate chip muffin. I didn't know. I, I like muffin was muffin, because in the dictionary it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you all different kind of muffin in the dictionary. So this drove me to the second part of my plan. While my brothers and sister were making friends with our own countrymen, they、uh, were hanging out with Taiwanese immigrants. They were hanging out with ESL students. They were hanging out with、uh, Cantonese students. A Chinese student, I made a point to be racist. I wouldn't make friends with anyone who spoke Mandarin or Cantonese or Chinese. I would exclusively made English-speaking friends. I made friends with East Indian people. I made friends with、uh, white people, black people, French people, whatever kind of people that spoke English. Running the risk of getting laughed at by my people, my friends. Constantly, because I would say something that was just a little bit off, and kids, and there's no mistaken, no, no, no,、uh, falsehood about that. Kids are, were, have always been kind of cruel, especially when they are in their teenage years. So my friend constantly laughed at me, but I took heart 
that when they laughed at me, I always ask them, okay, so how, how what was I supposed to say? Like, how am I supposed to say it? Uh, what is the proper way of saying that? And I learned, they laughed, I learned, well, my brothers and sisters were out there having fun, having easy time with people who spoke our own language. I let my friends laugh at me while I learned. In the summertime, while my siblings hang out with their Chinese friends, I convinced my parents to sign me up for a summer camp where there's no Chinese people, just out there uh, in the middle of the forest, camping out with uh, most, mostly Caucasian uh, children and Caucasian caretakers and counselors, and learned and learned and learned. By the time I was grade 11, I was the only person in my family that could speak good enough English to deal with business, to deal with recreation, to deal with filling out paperwork, completing applications, and so on and so on. And shortly after I left the family and went out on my own and went to college. Gradually, my family members drifted back to Taiwan because almost every one of them found it too difficult to find work to exist here in Canada because of the lack of English, including the siblings that laughed at me back then. While I found that I was now like a fish in water. I can converse fluently, if not perfectly, with people who speak English, with people who speak Mandarin, and I can even get along okay with people who speak Cantonese. When I was a teenager, and I believe I might have spoken about this before, I was extremely fat and chubby. My younger brother, Peter, was very slender. My older brother was tall and strongly built, very athletic. In fact, both of them, well, including my sister, actually, were more athletic than I was. So when they couldn't make fun of me on the language front anymore, they started to criticize me about being fat, started to make fun of me because I was not as athletic as the rest of them. I was kind of awkward and slow. And I mean, I, I was good at martial art, but uh, I looked like a tubby kid. So they made a lot of fun of me. And because of all the criticisms and all the uh, laughter I had to endure there, I started to throw myself, applying myself to sports and athletic events like it was going out of fashion. Uh, I went through a period of time when I was in high school that uh, I liked to skip class. I maintained a pretty good grade despite skipping classes. Uh, maybe one day I will tell you guys the trick of how to do that. But anyway, we will not go into that now. Uh, but uh, while other people skip classes to go home to sleep or go home to play video games or go uh, hang out in the back to smoke and smoke pot or stuff like that. When I skipped classes, I went to the gym. On average, when I was uh, between grade 11, grade 10 and 11, I guess, um, on average, I spent eight hours at the gym every day. And I didn't just go there and sit on the side and uh, uh, play on my phone or anything. But back then, we didn't have any phone to play on. I went to the gym. I worked out. I would uh, work out and lift weight, and I would do uh, 10, uh, 10 sets of 20 reps, and then I would take a break and do my homework and do my study for half an hour, and I would uh, do another 20 sets of uh, whatever. And I would swim. I signed myself uh, up to the swim team and I started to win trophies for the school. Um, I uh, 
joined the school's karate club and got back into doing martial art a lot. Suffice to say, by the time I finished high school, I was no longer the least athletic person in the family. In fact, by this time, even though I still had a little bit of baby fat on me when I left high school, I was definitely the strongest member in my household, and no one would look at me and laugh in my face because I was now、uh, more like a very buff. A bodybuilder with slight bit of pudginess to him, rather than the lard ass that I started out as. A lot of you guys have、uh, checked out the music Monday, and you have checked out、uh, my music and like them, and you like my guitar playing. Let me tell you, I didn't get into guitar until I was maybe sixteen, seventeen years old, and I just did it because、uh, I, I thought it was so awesome, so cool, and yeah, to be honest, I thought it would get me more girls,、uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so so. I basically signed up with a school's guitar band. I didn't know anything about playing guitar.、Uh, my mom bought me a beginner's Yamaha acoustic guitar.、Uh, it was about four hundred dollar back then. A very good guitar. I still have it today.、Um, and I remember the first day I brought that guitar to school. To the guitar band, I walked into the band room and took the guitar, guitar out of the case, and my band teacher of all people came up to me and said, "Ah, what a waste of a good guitar!" That comment cut me so deeply that right there and then I vowed I would become good at guitar if it killed me. So just like I did English, just like I did、uh, working out, from that day on, I would go home and I would spend at least an hour or two playing that guitar. I played until my fingers scabbed over and the scab broke, and my fingers would bleed and my fingers would be too sore to play. I wait until then. Heal, and then I play some more. Every day I came home, I played that guitar. I didn't know a lot of songs, so I would play random chords and try to make up lyrics of my own. And、uh, I would back then we didn't have YouTube video, so couldn't really go on YouTube to watch how people played or get guitar lessons. So it was all trials and errors. I listened to CDs, listened to what. A musician did and tried to <laughs> replicate what they did on the guitar. And about half a year to eight months later, I started to take first place in our guitar band. Every time we had a contest, every time we had an exam, and I started to be known as one of the best musicians in the school. I can go on and on, and if you look around yourself, you will probably notice that、uh, some of the most achieved, some of the most accomplished people in human history, presidents and generals and really successful people, came from backgrounds that were less than ideal. They didn't have a lot of positivity in their life. They didn't have a lot of goodness in their life. But maybe because of the pressure and the challenge they grew up in, they managed. To become a lot more than they would have been otherwise. Thank you for checking out today's Soul Search Sunday. We'll be back again tomorrow for Music Monday. For now, farewell and have a good night.